Welcome to Dark Celtic <laughs> History. <laughs> Six Tales of Monsters from the Water's Depth. If you like my stories, check out my writing at www.authorjeffreymcdonald.com. The Celtic world has more than its share of the supernatural, legends, and myth, which sometimes cross the line into reality. I tell those tales here on Dark Celtic History. <laughs> the Water Horse of Loch the Beast. The beach at Melon Udrigal and Western Rost is stunning aqua blue waves lap against white sands, giving the shoreline an almost tropical feel. However, the backdrop is distinctly Scottish, with views of Solven, the mountains of Kodak and, and Tilak, the forge, that's what that means. Yet, for all the tranquility of the spot, once upon a time something more sinister was said to lurk in the depths of the nearby loch. Loch na Beast, or the Loch of the Beast, was said to be the home of a Ech Ushka, or shape-shifting water horse, that's what Ech Ushka means. The water horse is similar to a Kelpie, but whereas the Kelpie is said to dwell in rivers and streams, the Ech Ushka is the denizen of the freshwater and sea locks of Scotland. However, this water spirit is said to be far more vicious and cruel than a Kelpie. It can disguise itself as a fine horse, a handsome man, or even a giant bird called the Abubri. Now, whilst in the horse's form, a human is only safe to ride the Ushka, the Ek Ushka on dry land. Once it smells water, its skin becomes like an adhesive. Its rider is held captive and the creature returns to the deepest part of the loch. Uh, after its victim is drowned, the Akushka tears its meal apart and devours it, leaving only the liver which floats to the water surface. Now understandably, the locals who lived in this remote corner of the Western Highlands were clearly not impressed to have such a ferocious neighbor living in their backyard. Who could tell why when they or their children or even their livestock would become the beast's next meal. Now, depending on who is telling the story, the next series of events occurred either in 1840 or 1864. Apparently, the locals could no longer tolerate the prospect of becoming the creature's next meal and implored the owner of the estate, Mr. Banks, to make measures to put an end to the beast. Alas, initially, his tenants beseeching fell on deaf ears, until one fateful day when Sandy MacLeod, an elder of the Free Church of Scotland, was returning from service in Alt Bay. She was in the company of two other witnesses when they saw the beast, a creature which was said to resemble the upturned keel of a good-sized boat. Soon after, Kenneth Cameron, also an elder of the Free Church, saw the water horse too. Now who could be more reputable than two elders of the Kirk? It seemed there was no alternatives, and Banks decided to jump into action by pumping out the water from the lock. Now with the water now standing at half a meter, the beast, well, he was still at large. Banks sent his boat, the Iris, to Broadford in Skye to procure 14 barrels of lime. Banks could not persuade any of the terrified tenants to enter the lock, so he called on two of the crew from the Iris to do the job for him. Entering the lock in a small rowboat, James and Alan Mackenzie began probing the waters with their oars at length. Now they found a hole two and a half fathom deep. Surely this must be where the beast had its lair. They poured lime into the cavity, and strangely, the beast, it didn't show itself in that lock. That day, or ever since. But the beast is not thought to have died, because when the crowd of tenants you know, happy with what they have done, came back to Mr. Banks' estate to, hit to his house to celebrate the beast's death, they found the body or what was left of Sandy McLeod and her liver upon an altar of bones, with hoof prints leading over the hill behind Mr. Banks' home.
Store Worm, Orkney's Dragon. Now Vikings, they played a huge role in the medieval history of the British Isles. Most likely you know that they raided churches and settlements, but they also colonized parts of Scotland such as Shetland, Orkney, and parts of the of Cathanus. The Norse brought with them scalds and bards who told heroic sagas and tales of dragons and of store worms. You may never have heard of the store worm. However, it seems likely that the uh, store worm made its way into Scottish folk tales via Viking lore. Now, Scotland is an island country, so Scottish dragons are often not winged beasts, but usually watery monsters. The most famous is the Loch Ness Monster, or Nessie as she is fondly called. In ancient times, people thought Scotland was located at the end of the world. It is uh, any wonder that in, on old maps the unknown was filled with strange creatures and the words, here be dragons. Now in time, Orkney, the islands to the north of Scottish mainland, created their own dragon, the uh, evil Mester Stormworm. Storeworm. And it seems the Orcadians got some uh, help from their neighbor, their, the Vikings. Now Orkney did not always belong to Scotland. The early inhabitants of Orkney were Picts. At that time, the nation of Scotland did not exist. Then, with the rise of the Vikings in the 8th century, the Orkney Islands became an, en an enclave of Norway. The Orkney Islands became an enclave of Norway. The Norsemen brought with them sea monsters carved into the prows of their ships, and their skulls told tales of dragons in their sagas. The origins of the name Storworm would come from Old Norse word um, Stordurglander. This is uh, another name for Jornmunglander, a serpent from Norse mythology, fathered by Loki. Now, yet store is also a Scots word meaning dust or to pour or flood. The word worm comes from the Old English worm with a Y, meaning dragon or serpent. However, the tale of Mester Storeworm reads like something straight out of a Viking saga. Now, the Mester Storeworm was the master of all storeworms. So large it's said that it could wrap itself around the whole world. Nobody could say with any surety where the storeworm came from, but if the rumors were true, this monstrous sea creature was the creation of a malevolent spirit. Soon he began a reign of terror. He, uh, began, he began one of the nine plagues to curse the world. The creature was so big it could crush castles with its long forked tongue and sweep entire cities into its maw. Ships crackled like eggshells before its uh, monstrosity. Its putrid breath was poison to every living thing, and its head was as large as a mountain, and its eyes were the size of dark locks. Wherever the storeworm's head came to rest, it would demand that the neighboring people feed it. In time, the creature developed a taste for a rare delicacy. On the seventh day of the week at sunrise, the storeworm would awaken and yawn nine times. He would then demand a meal of seven virgins. Soon the people became tired of losing their daughters to the giant dragon. In desperation, the people sought the advice of an old wizard. His solution was simple. Feed the king's daughter to the storeworm. The serpent would leave and trouble them no more. Alas, the poor king was so distraught when he heard this, for the princess was his only daughter the apple of his eye. The grief-stricken king pleaded for another solution, but alas, there was none. In return, he received a ten-week reprieve. With a heavy heart, the king sent uh, couriers across the land, seeking a hero capable of slaying the dragon. As an incentive, the king also was offering a great reward. The successful warrior would receive the kingdom. Also, he would win the mighty sword um, Sicker Snapper. Ooh, inherited from Odin himself. Wow. The reward attracted many valiant warriors. Alas, though, most fled on encountering the beast. Only twelve had the courage to stay and face the monster. But things did not go favorably for the brave men with the be uh, beast slaying them all. The last week arrived and it seemed all was lost. But on the last day, an unlikely hero arrived. His name was Asapotl, which means the cinder lad. He was the seventh son of a seventh son and 
a bit of a dreamer. He lived with his family on a farm, but while his father and brothers worked hard, Asapadal was content to sit at the hearth, where he would make up poems and stories and get covered in thick peat ash because he was in La La Land, dreaming a way of better life. Much to his brother's chagrin, he used to use his imagination, his vivid imagination, to make up tales, where he was the hero. Now his siblings laughed at him, berated him for being lazy and useless. Upon hearing the knight's plight, Asapato slipped away from the farm. He escaped to his little boat, armed only with a bucket containing a smoldering peat from his hearth. In the darkness, he sneaked up on the sleeping beast, but this was the seventh day of the week, and with the sunrise, the storeworm began to yawn. Each yawn sucked a vast tide of water into the dragon's mouth. Once Asapotl was close enough, one of the mighty yawns drew the poor boy and his little vessel into the creature's cavernous mouth. Soon he was whirling down the beast's throat, carried by a torrent of seawater. Then the boat grounded abruptly. Picking up the bucket, Asapotl ran for his life. Asapotl turned a corner and found the dragon's liver. Pulling out a knife, Asapotl gouged a hole in it. Then he stuffed a smoldering peat into the wound. Soon the liver began to burn. Asapotl ran back to his boat. There was not a minute to lose, for the worm retched and spewed out the intrepid boy along with his boat, making it back to shore. The boy watched as the dragon began to burn. Black smoke billowed from the monster's nostrils. In agony, its forked tongue shot out and grabbed hold of one of the horns of the moon. In its weakened state, its tongue slipped and crashed, causing a deep rift in the earth. As the beast writhed in agony, teeth dropped from its vile, foaming mouth. The first lot of falling teeth formed the Orkney Islands. As the falling teeth rained down the Shetland Isles and the Faroe Isles, then, in its dying moments, the storeworm curled up tightly and became the country we now know as Iceland. Asapato was married to the princess, and the folk rejoiced for the storeworm was finally dead. Oh, wow. What an awesome story. I wonder if it has any base in truth. Hmm. A lot of these myths do, you know. The True Ushti, or Water Bowl. The True Ushti was formerly a regular visitor of the Isle of Man. A resident of Man, George Waldron, said, A neighbor of mine who kept cattle had his fields infested with this animal. He had lost several cows to the beast. He therefore placed a man to continually keep watch. And one day, bringing him word that a strange bull was am among the cows, he had no doubt it was the Water Bowl called a good number of hardy men to his assistance, who were all armed with great poles, pitchforks, and other weapons to properly defend themselves from this dangerous enemy. They went to the place where they were told he was and run all together at him, but he was too nimble for their pursuit, and after tiring them out over the mountains and rocks in a great space of stony ground, he took to the river and avoided any, ch any further chase by diving down into it. Every now and then he would show his head above the water as if to mock them. Now it's to believe that this imaginary animal has not yet become extinct. Only a few years ago, the farmer of Slough Mail in parish of Auchen um, was on a Sunday evening return from a place of worship when at the gallery of Slegaby, a wild looking animal with large eyes sparkling like fire crossed the road before him and went flapping away. This he knew to be a true Ushti, for his father had seen one at nearly the same place. Over the back of this animal he broke his walking stick. So lazy was it to get out of the way, this man's brother had also seen a true Ushti and in the same neighborhood. When proceeding to the fold very early one morning in the month of June to let the cattle out to feed before the heat of the day came on, he saw a water bull standing outside the fold. When the bull perceived him, he instantly broke through the fence and ran at him, roaring and tearing up the ground with his feet. But the true Ushdi scampered away seemingly quite unconcerned and leaping over an adjoined precipice, plunging into the deep water and after, swimming about a little, eventually amusing himself, he gave out a loud bellow and just disappeared. 
It is believed that the water bull is a demonic and it forced to live in the form of the true Ashti, to spend all of eternity as the one beast he despised the most. The Mystery of the Lighthouse Keepers of Aelin Moor Nahalen Flanach is the Scottish Gaelic name of the small group of islands known in English as the Flannan Islands. Located in Scotland's Outer Hebrides, Nahalen Seer, also known as the Seven Hunters, they stand just over 20 miles from the Isle of Lewis. They are a bird sanctuary and at times a place of awesome beauty. At others, the, these remote islands bear the brunt of severe Atlantic storms, which whip the seas into frenzy and force even the hardy gulls to stay sheltered in the cliff face cracks. For many years, they have remained uninhabited, the last residents of any length being the lighthouse keepers, who between 1899 and its automation in 1971 kept the light burning on the highest point of the island group, Ellen Moore. Until the lighthouse had been, been built between 1895 and 1899, it is probable that Nahalen Flanach had been inhabited permanently since the days of the Celtic Church. The Celtic Church was predominantly across the Celtic-speaking world in the early Middle Ages, 5th to the 10th centuries. On the island of Ellen Moore is the ruin of an old chapel dedicated to St. To Flanach. However, over many centuries, for many of the Gallic Hebridean community, the islands have been viewed as a place of superstition and bad luck, a view that was reinforced by the tragic and mysterious events that befell the lighthouse keepers on Ellen Moore in mid-December 1900. Now, it is the fate of the lighthouse keepers in 1900, just over one year after the island's lighthouse came into operation, that it was the cause of such mystery and speculation. For all three keepers, Thomas Marshall, James Duquette, and Donald MacArthur disappeared without a trace. It was on the 15th of December, 1900, that the ship Archter, which was sailing for Scotland from Philadelphia, had reported that they had passed the islands. The lighthouse was not in operation. In those days, there was no radio communication between the keepers on Ellen Moore and the shore station of Breshcleet on Lewis when the lighthouse tender Hesperus arrived on St. Stephen's Day, 26th of December 1900, having been delayed due to adverse conditions, they found the lighthouse abandoned. The first man ashore was relief keeper Joseph Moore, who found no sign of the missing man. His preliminary search revealed the doors of the lighthouse closed, the clocks stopped, the beds unmade, and fire not lit. Returning from the Has Hesperus, with two others, the lighthouse must have felt eerie, having been abandoned without any visible reason. Lamps were all cleaned and filled, and the only thing out of place was a chair by the kitchen table that had been knocked over. A further unusual thing was that two of the light, two of the keeper's oil skins were missing, but the third set was still in place. The lighthouse keeper's log had no further entries after the day that they had disappeared and a message on a slate on the 15th of December 1900 indicate nothing unusual as well. The search of the island gave no sign of the three missing men. Searches of the vicinity revealed storm damage on the west landing of the island caused by severe weather, but the log indicated that this had happened prior to the last log entry on the 15th of December. However, a superintendent of the Northern Lighthouse Board uh, the General Lighthouse Authority for Scotland and Isle of Man, Robert Murid, uh, came to Island Moor on the 29th of December 1900, and he speculated what had happened was that the two of the keepers had gone to the western landing stage to secure a box in which mooring ropes were stored. Then, having been joined by the third keeper, an exceptionally large wave had washed them away. However, the real events of the December day will never be known. Why, for example, did the third keeper leave the lighthouse against regulations and without the protection of his oilskins to join his colleagues? It was always made clear that the third keeper should not leave the White House during a storm for any reason. Perhaps 
as some have also suggested, he had seen his fellow keepers in trouble and rushed to their aid, knocking over the chair on the way. However, if the men were on the west landing stage, they would have not been able to be seen by anyone in the lighthouse, nor within shouting distance. Strangely, if he was in such a panic, why had he stopped to secure the door of the lighthouse and its compound on the way to help his colleagues? The mystery remained unsolved, and is likely to remain so until the bodies of the keepers are found. However, what has been found is a strange leather journal floating in calm seas by a local fisherman in April of 1901. Not having a good day out fishing, the fisherman, only known by the name Blair, sat back to eat his lunch and contemplate what he would do next, and where he might fish next. While looking out upon the still waters, he noticed something afloat. At first, he told himself not to let curiosity get the better of him, but the disappearance of the lighthouse men was still fresh on the memories. Using a net, he scooped up the leather-bound book and began to examine it, as he suspected it belonged to one of the men from the lighthouse on Island Moor. As he turned the fragile pages, he began to read, and the story that leapt off the page sent chills down his back and put fear in his heart. Upon getting to work at the lighthouse, the three men settled down into routine. And we, as we all know, routine can be very boring. So when they could, the men would explore the island and make their lives go by a little faster. One day, while Thomas was in the lighthouse and not wearing his oil skins, the other two men were wearing their skins and in a completely different mood than earlier. They were, happily, they were happy and joking around, but they would not let Thomas know why. Soon the reason would become all too clear. The door to the lighthouse burst open and a large, muscular man grabbed James and Donald and dragged them outside, where more men and a woman were waiting. James and Donald were on their knees in the middle of a circle of them, while the woman pointed an accusing figure, finger their way. Thomas went, on, Thomas went out after them, securing the door behind him, and stared on in disbelief, knowing he was outnumbered. Then, without warning, two of the intruders raised fishing spears and plunged them to James and Donald. Thomas was stricken with fear and unable to move or react, afraid he would be killed as well. A couple of the men gathered the now dead bodies of his co-workers and carried them away to a watery grave, while the others turned on Thomas. He was told to say nothing and he could live and he quickly agreed, but he wanted to know why his friends had to die. Earlier, while out exploring the island, they had come across a young woman sunning on the rocks. Instead of trying to woo her, they chose to rape her. Only after the act was completed did they realize she was a selkie, which startled them having seen a mythological creature. The selkie grabbed up her skins, dove into the water, and the two men, thinking they had gotten away with something, went back to the lighthouse happy. But the Selkie's revenge would come soon. When the male Selkie's heard what had happened, they enacted immediate revenge. Thomas made the mistake of sitting down on the rocks outside and immediately writing down all that had happened in his journal. And only minutes after the incident, they returned for him. The last inscription reads, God help me, they have returned. Blair sailed back to his port as fast as the winds would take him. And just when land came into sight, he heard a thud on the side of his boat. He looked over, and he could see the Selkie reaching for the journal. He was paralyzed in fear. The Selkie turned and asked if he had read it. Blair responded, yes. Then the Selkie responded, don't be like Thomas. And he turned and swam off. Blair never said a word until he was old and on his deathbed and then nobody took the rambling of an old man seriously. Events such as this always attract speculation of the supernatural or become embellished as folklore. It is easy to see why. These remote, isolated rocky islands battered by the howling winds of the Atlantic, the high waves driven restlessly against the cliff faces, the constant screeching of seabirds sounding like lost souls in a storm, it is said that keepers posted to the lighthouse in Ellen Moore after the tragedy never felt at ease there, like they were being watched. It was thought by many who have a dark and foreboding atmosphere surrounding it, and few lamented the automation of 
the lighthouse in 1971, which meant it no longer had to be manned. The Selkie The Selkie folk in the mythology of Orkney and Shetland are a supernatural race of shape-shifting seal creatures. They are said to be able to shed their seal skin and then take human form. However, it was vital for the Selkie never to lose its seal skin, for that is which gave them the ability to return to their original seal form. Sometimes the Selkies were known for shedding their skins and sunbathing on the beaches and rocks in their human form. Selkie males were said to be able to turn into handsome mortals and are noted for their encounters with women they were able to seduce. Selkie females are also said to be highly attractive in their human form to men. In this tale, a handsome young fisherman finds a group of Selkie folk lying naked on the rocks in the sunshine. He surprises them and all but one manages to, manages to retrieve their seal skins and escape to the water. In her haste, one of the Selkie folk leaves her skin on the rock and is not able to return to seal form because the fisherman has taken her seal skin. Now the Selkie woman follows him and begs him for the return of her skin. He refuses though, knowing the legend of the Selkie, and in need of a wife, he must re she must remain in human form and must do as he bids, for he holds the key to her shape-shifting, the sealskin. Women in these isles are rare, and beautiful women are even rarer, and she is of great beauty. Before long she succumbs to his demands, having no real choice. Before long she ends up marrying the fisherman. Together she has a relatively happy life even caring for the fisherman to some extent. They remain together for many years and she bears him seven children, all boys except one. The one day, after regaling her young daughter with the tale of the Selkies, the young girl confesses she has knowledge of a Selkie skin. With the aid of her young daughter, the Selkie discovers the hidden seal skin. She grabs it and she returns to the sea without haste. She dons the skin and swims out to join the Selkie husband that she was forced to leave behind, which she never told anyone. As the Selkie swims away from the shore, she sees her human husband, the fisherman, rowing back to land after a fishing trip. Still having some feelings for him, after all he has done, she shouts to him and tells him that she is leaving to return to her Selkie husband, and he, she hopes he understands because she loves him so much more. The fisherman never saw his Selkie wife again. He was very sad, but he understood. After all, he robbed her of her life. It is said that until the day of his, the end of his days, he would wander the sea edge, ever looking out for his lost love. But. He did remarry. You see, after returning to her Selkie land under the sea, she told stories of her time as a human mortal. She told her stories more for educational purposes, though, than to entertain. A warning, you see. However, one Selkie, who had never taken a husband, listened intently to every word. She finally approached the new, uh, newly returned Selkie and lamented her life under the sea and how she wished for the life the other had so easily left behind. Hearing this, the Selkie had a brilliant idea, for she had been feeling regret for the troublesome, lonesome fisherman she had left so abruptly behind. She took the other Selkie and guided her to the dock where her ex-husband's boat was moored. There they waited for him to embark on his daily fishing, and there he was introduced to his new wife. Everyone was happy, and everyone was where they were supposed to be. The End Ellen Donan and the Sea Maidens In the past, sailors believed that sea locks and the islands within were home to mermaids and sea maidens, and Ellen Donan is no exception. 
a common element in all the Seal Maiden or Selkie tales, and perhaps the most important is the fact that in order to shapeshift, they had to cast off their seal skins. Within these magical skins lay the power to return the seal, the seal form, and therefore to see. Now, if this seal skin was lost or stolen, the creature was doomed to remain in human form until it could be recovered. If a human discovered the seal skin, they could hold the maiden captive. Now, in one local legend, three brothers went fishing in the loch one night near Elendonan. They became enraptured by three seal maidens who had shed their seal skins and assumed human forms, while they danced by the moonlight on the sands. Now the brothers stole their furs, intending to claim the seal maidens as their wives. The youngest one was so moved by his intended distress that he returned her seal skin and as a reward for his kindness was permitted to see his love on every ninth night. The middle son's wife found her fur and was able to escape back to the sea. However, tragedy struck the eldest son, the eldest brother. He tried to burn his wife's fur as a preventive measure from her ever leaving him again. However, the seal skin, even when separated from its owner, is still a part of them. And when he lit the skin on fire, he lit her on fire as well, unknowingly burning his wife to death in the process, losing her forever. Now the eldest brother was so distraught and contemplating taking his own life, and his brothers knew this. So when they found him dead only a few days later, drowned in the shallow water surrounding Ellen Donan, they assumed he had committed that fateful act. However, nine days later, following when the youngest brother's love returned, she informed the remaining brothers that justice was spelled out for her, for their oldest brother's sin, by the community of the Selkies for his selfishness that caused the death of one of their seal maidens. Wow.